Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about foreign policy for the world as it is. Our guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar and lecturer, and Manfred Henningsen, emeritus professor in political science at UH Manoa. So let's see if we can scope this out. It's based on an article by Ben Rhodes in Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, um, a couple couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and it's in the July August edition of Foreign Affairs. Gene, why don't you talk about exactly where this article goes and what it offers us for the possibilities of discussion? Well, Ben Rhodes is a uh, foreign policy expert who has written a book on um, contemporary the contemporary world and where he thinks our foreign policy should go. And he is a Democrat, uh, an advisor, and he has uh, basically moderately looked at the Biden administration, where it has succeeded and where he thinks it has fallen down and where it needs to go. And uh, he talks about the major challenges of the world and he says it's a changed world. In other words, that he accepts as a baseline that America is no longer what's called the virtuous hegemon, meaning that it is not the lone superpower. And um, it, it doesn't concede superpowerdom to any other nation, such as China, but it does say that the world does operate better when it is under American leadership. And what it has done is broken down into our foreign policy under Biden has become, for better or worse, a question of alliances, of um, specific goals, uh, for example, in Asia, uh, rather than trying to pass a general uh, trade law uh, that benefits the allies we have there, we have formed a coalition of the willing, uh, including Australia and the UK in Asia, with Japan and uh, a few other uh, countries, Sing uh, uh, Philippines, and perhaps to some extent Singapore, uh, in trying to contain what is viewed as China's aggression. Secondly, on the climate crisis, uh, a great Thing that the Biden administration did was uh, pass the uh, CHIPS Act, which allows for uh, manufacturing of uh, essential technological supplies, chips, in America. Um, significantly, Taiwan manufactures chips better than anybody else. And there is a concern about the China-Taiwan uh, hostility developing into a push by China to take over Taiwan by 2027. So, and then he goes into the AI uh, challenge, which very few people really understand today, and the Biden administration needing to work with other countries. His general thrust is that these uh, blowups in Ukraine and Gaza have really detracted from uh, the administration's ability to move forward with American leadership that also includes other countries and succeeds in tackling the most important crises, the climate crisis, what AI means for the future in terms of our, our nuclear stability in the world and um, foreign policy um, at home uh, in terms of how Americans view America versus uh, in terms of its investment in the world versus its trade policies versus the decline of, of, of faith in globalization and the perception that the right wing uh, of Trump has, uh, has created in, in terms of American voters and where that is going. So Manfred, you know, uh, he it, it's, it starts out as the idea that we can make American foreign policy great again. But in the process, he takes, uh, he takes some criticism of American foreign policy. 
Uh, can you talk about that? And can you talk about whether you agree with his criticism of American foreign policy? Well, look, American foreign policy has been a mess for quite some time. I mean, the last war that the U.S. won was against German, Nazi Germany. Uh, after that, you know, there's a line of one defeat after another. And what is happening uh, in the Ukraine and uh, in Palestine, if uh, the opponents will win, that will be, in a way, uh, really a damper for this notion that America is a superpower, a virtuous superpower. I mean, Biden's behavior toward Israel is uh, embarrassing. Uh, and I think they have to, I mean, I don't know what will happen next, this, no, next month when when Netanyahu comes and gives a speech before Congress, whether all the Democrats will be there uh, or not, or whether Biden will invite him. So American foreign policy is uh, in a very difficult uh, situation, and they cannot, they cannot not support the Ukraine. They certainly cannot not support Israel, but not in the way they have done, uh, you know, for quite some time now. So I am, uh, but then you have, on the other hand, you know, which is somewhat uh, underestimated in the U.S. in uh, foreign policy circles, you have uh, this problem with Europe. Uh, the European Union, you know, is uh, in trouble if uh, the right wing wins in France. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, the European Union has not moved to the right, but if the right wing wins in France, uh, it will be a, really a major a problem for the management of American foreign policy with regard to NATO and the EU. I think at this point, Europe, well, Europe will be divided. You have the northern uh, and the countries that are close to, to Russia and Germany, continue, and, Fr and Italy also continuing to support the Ukraine. But uh, if France gets into more financial problems, as it is already, uh, a major supporter will leave that coalition in support of uh, the Ukraine. And that is very, very troubling. Well, you know, it, it seems to me, this, this reminds me of Simon Winchester's book, Pacific, where he has these vignettes about um, various countries and events around the rim of the Pacific. And one point he makes clear is that if we thought after World War II um, that we were the hegemon in, in all of the Pacific and that we were the top dog, that's simply not so anymore. Um, and, and actually, Rhodes goes into that to some degree in the article about the Pacific. But I think it's clear that what he's saying is we're not, we're not the hegemon in Europe or anywhere anymore, and we have to get used to that. Um, that's what uh, Simon Winchester said, and that's what Rhodes is saying. We have to get used to it. We have to recalibrate, I think is the term it uses, our policy mm, to wrap around the notion that we are no longer the top dog, however we got here. So, so Gene, I mean, this is of some concern, isn't it? Um, I, guess, I guess we three here accept that notion, that there are a lot of people that are dwelling in in the land of um, the land of uh, 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 what what's the term he used as a maximization, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> uh, we're not going to be able. Am I right? We're not going to be able to develop the kind of foreign policy he is suggesting unless we recognize that. Your thoughts? Maximization, I don't believe, has ever succeeded in American policy, nor have we really pursued that policy. We have always worked within alliances from the very beginning after World War II. The emphasis was upon Europe 
as most of our foreign policy has been through most of our history, it is only recently that we have, quote, pivoted toward the Pacific. And being a West Coaster and Californian, <laughs> that has seemed to be, to be too little too late because the more dynamic economies in the world are in Asia. Asia is an awakened giant. China is extremely important for the future of the world. And I am reassured to see Biden making, reaching out to China, even in the context of an extreme right-wing antipathy toward China and attempt to create a narrative about China as our perpetual enemy. Actually, as de Tocqueville determined way back before the Civil War when he came to visit us, this great French intellectual, our natural rival in the world is Russia, not China. China and Russia are uneasy allies. They have lots of reasons to be wary of one another. And there's just been a wonderful article out about Xi Jinping. His father was a Russia expert. And his father um, taught him as a high, his father was a high um, official in Mao's uh, government and elite, that you can't get too close to Russia, but you can't be too far away from it either. So looking at that and what this will play out for the world in the future may be the most important thing, I think, in foreign policy going forward. Looking at the relationship between China and Russia and how this relationship affects Europe, because we have always been Atlantic oriented, but now Europe, as Manfred has often emphasized, has an opportunity to create its own federal system, which would be half a billion people all together. All the countries in Europe together uh, under a, a federal union would be half a billion people. And it's half a billion of very advanced and dynamic people. So we want this, we want this. It's an additional buffer in a complicated world between Russia and us, quite frankly. Russia, on the other hand, has been very active under Putin in promoting this notion that America's time is over with, that we are now in a multipolar world. And by that, they mean it's time for the Chinese and the Russians to get together and dominate. But we've never actually dominated. We've always been working collaboratively, setting up institutions. If we take over a country or we defeat a country, eventually we give it up. How many Russian, how many Russian regimes have done that? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think countries in the world, when their leaders come to power, despite all the anti-American rhetoric, they recognize that if they're going to have a superpower, that they can, who's under umbrella, they can crouch when it rains hard. Um, it should be the U.S. You know, um, I, I kept thinking as I read that article about Golda Meir, famous for an iconic statement she made. Um, she said, it's impossible to negotiate peace with someone who is sworn to destroy you, to kill you. Um, and, I th and I thought of Putin in that regard. Um, he, he's kind of a psychopath, isn't he? Um, he is sworn to destroy us. Um, he is trying to argue with us and fight with us no matter what. How can you, you trust a man like that? And, and the Golda Meir uh, statement comes to mind. Um, now, this Ben Rhodes article talks about a, a new paradigm, a new foreign policy where we negotiate um, more. And we hope to. Uh, solve these global block problems by negotiating with the likes of Putin. Manfred, is that practical? Look, you have, um, I mean, Jean did not talk about that at all, and you have not mentioned it as well. America is a divided country at this point, and uh, the divisions go very deep. They go as deep as they went, uh, you know, before the Civil War between the liberal part of America, the northern states, and uh, the southern states, uh, America was not a union at that point, a complete union. You know, it was a very, very divided uh, country. And when 
Jean was talking about Europe, she made a reference to these federal tendencies in Europe. Yeah, it would be nice if this federal republic, federal European republic would come into being. But I think the European situation is not unlike the one that you had in the US before the Civil War. Now, I don't know whether Putin's threats will be helpful for the unification, turning the EU into a European federal republic. It may be that Europe would need Trump as president also, so that you have these two evil characters, Putin and Trump, you know, threaten, threatening Europe to come together. But I think when you are talking about the Rhodes article, it is important to talk about Robert Kagan's book on rebellion, the book on anti American anti liberalism. It's a scary book uh, because he is uh, connecting the contemporary situation, you know, with American history in a way people normally don't do. Uh, and I think for that reason, you know, whatever Broads and others may think about American foreign policy in the future, I think America's in trouble as much as France is in trouble. And then, you know, China is, you could say, even more in trouble because the economic situation of the PRC is not uh, all that rosy. And when we come to Russia, you know, it's the same thing. So we are talking not about uh, a very consolidated geopolitical uh, condition of the world at this point. Uh, there are a lot of problem areas. And for that reason, you know, the, the one we are always looking to, not only because we're living here, because uh, it is the most powerful, still the most powerful country in the world, this country that people want to have as an umbrella, security umbrella, is in trouble. Okay, well, I'm, I think that's a true fact. And I wondered about it reading the article, uh, whether you know Ben Rhodes uh, uh, counts that in, because um, he seems to be talking about, you know, about Biden's policy and what Biden would do and what Biden should do. Um, but but Trump and he, he mentions uh, Trump's failures in foreign policy and the threat um, of another administration by Trump. For sure, we all have to know. But but the reality is, I I think that this kinder, gentler, more amenable foreign policy that he is suggesting can't work under Trump. There's no way it can work. Uh, Trump did uh, enormous damage. Look at all the wreckage he left behind. Uh, why in the world would that work? And, and why is Ben Rhodes suggesting it when we all know it won't work? Jean? Well, I think Ben Rhodes uh, is addressing Biden's foreign policy in the world going forward because it's a campaign year, because he is a Democrat. Not that he is gilding the lily or saying anything untruthful. He's trying to bring to the fore uh, issues, acknowledging that the world has changed, that we aren't going to be a solitary hegemon going forward, that the challenges are probably the most difficult challenges since before World War II. We've talked on this program before about, does this resemble 1938? Some of, us, some of us think more than others than it does. And in addition to that, as Manfred has brought up, and we have also discussed on this program before, the, the United States is polarized. It is um, harboring a proto-fascist authoritarian movement, the MAGA movement, um, which has its roots in American extremism, um, as both Manfred and I have studied through the years. And that it also has uh, echoes throughout the world because democracy is in peril. And part of the reason I would argue why democracy is being attacked now and we are facing some of these issues is because of Putin. He's got an agenda. He's made it very clear since 2009 and 2014 what that agenda is. It's to 
basically overthrow American influence and replace it with Russian and Chinese influence. And that's what he's engaged in doing. And he is doing it in two ways, by words and propaganda, which of course is very much a part of the science of power relationships since World War I, actually. And he is doing it by blowing up uh, very, uh, very sensitive parts of the world, like the Middle East and Ukraine, and leaving us to deal with it. It's like having, you know, you're, you're a teacher in a class. I used to be a, a teacher in the lower grades. And you got your class all in order. Everybody's learning beautifully. We're, we're making, we're learning, we're, we're growing, we're developing, we're having a good time. And some little delinquent comes into the room and decides to upend everything. It's so much easier to do that than it is to build. Tearing down is always easier. And he's doing it through the fascist playbook. Uh, Russia's not communist, it's fascist. And we need to understand that too. So the world has changed. And the world will change more uh, if, if uh, Trump wins. And a lot of people think he will win. A lot of people in Europe think he will win. Uh, and so he is not going to accept um, Ben Rhodes's proposal. He is going to do the same kinds of things he did before. He wrecked our relationship such as it was with Iran. Um, and he has uh, threatened to, well, and he has gone a long way to undermine Ukraine. Um, he is a destroyer, a destructor. He's never going to accept Ben Rose's idea of a new and kinder, gentler foreign policy. Never. But let's assume for this discussion, Manfred, that somewhere along the line, either Biden wins and he uh, adopts a policy like Ben Rose is suggesting. And let's assume, for example, the world would accept it. Let's assume it works to some degree. Um, with Putin and, and with Xi Jinping, and with, uh, don't forget, uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, so let's assume that some people accept it, other people will reject it, but it is a good idea. Let's assume that. What happens to the world? How does the world evolve if Ben Rhodes' policies are appealing um, to these great powers? Well, look, when we are talking about the United States, it's not only Biden or Trump, it's a divided country. And uh, that anti-liberalism is uh, tearing apart uh, this country, and it will not go away if Biden wins. So he has to deal with that uh, directly in Congress without Trump uh, as a competitor. So for that reason, when we are talking about the future that Rhodes and you are on an vision, and Rhodes, you don't completely uh, support roads, but envisioning that future, you have to be aware that this division, the division in this country may get worse if Biden wins, uh, because, uh, you know, you will have then uh, this potential, I don't think it will become directly a civil war, but you have this warlike tension uh, that emerges in the United States. You had that, you know, before the Civil War, and then it became war. Uh, now, the issues may not be the same, but you have to remember, we have talked about that before, uh, that uh, you could say one of the foundational features of the American Republic has been from the founding racism, and it has not gone away. Uh, and uh, since, uh, you know, the white majority will not last much longer in this country, you will have these uh, racial tensions becoming uh, very, very powerful. Now, you have them also in Europe, even though I would say in Europe, you know, you, they are much more tainted by religious prejudices, especially against Muslim in France. Uh, in Germany, that is, I said, contained because the Turks uh, are not uh, playing along in the way, you know, the radical imams would like uh, to, to see. But uh, I, I look... I, what I get from what you're saying, Manfred, is that uh, what I get is that Ben... Rhodes' suggestion, uh, his proposal, his recommendation for 
um, a recalibration of American foreign policy is actually impossible. It's impossible domestically, uh, one way or the other, and it's impossible in the world at large. Uh, right. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Gene, what do you think? Is Ben Rhodes just spinning wheels? I think that he brings up briefly something that I think is the most important thing in the article and for us going forward. I feel that given the degree of extremism, and I understand where the religious right is going, it wants to roll back all of these social gains that women and gays have made over the years. And they want to go back to the 1950s uh, or their view of the 1950s. And they want a Christian republic. So that's retrograde. It's not a eurocentric, a eurocentric it's, it's, Christian it's, republic. It's retrograde, but but it's it's not going to fly. They're fighting a losing battle, but they're fighting it in a way that's very very distressing. I don't think we're on the verge of a civil war. I think that we're a a, a, a federal republic that was based on conflict. And that we have built in mechanisms to take care of that. What we don't have built in mechanisms for, though, is a personality like Trump, who's a charismatic leader, has embraced a fascist ideology, and has awakened and unleashed forces within the United States that are minority forces, but have been so aggressive and so propagandistic that they have acquired a large following that in that puts us at risk. If Trump becomes president, and this is what I think is most important going forward, we are going to be much closer to unleashing a World War III. No fascist leader can consolidate power and unify a divided country without creating an external enemy or an internal scapegoat or both to be aggressive against in order to bring the country together through a fictitious worldview about the situation. And given Trump's temperament as impulsive and volatile and an absolutist as he is, and also, frankly, as untutored in how to run a country or the world, uh, we are at great risk. Well, uh, Manfred, do you agree with that? And do you, do you think that the American populace electorate, the people, understand it. Um, this is very problematic because we're, we seem to be shoving off from any civilized notion of global engagement. Look, I, I, do, not, uh, I do not believe that a civil war or th World War III uh, is on, are on the horizon. But I think when we are talking about the United States, and it, be, it, it really became reinforced by reading Robert Kagan's book, you know, a Rebellion, uh, what has always been a problem, and he emphasizes it again and again, is not so much the, re the religious, it's the ethnic, it's the racial dimension. And uh, the white American majority will be gone by 35. And that is really driving uh, people to Trump. It's not uh, Christian fundamentalism that adds to it, uh, but it's uh, this replacement ideology that you have also in Hungary uh, and in some other Eastern European countries. Strangely enough, uh, well, you have it also in the AFD in Germany. Uh, so it is, uh, that is a global Western phenomenon. The only country you could say, well, both China and Japan don't suffer from it. Uh, they will suffer from depopulation for different reasons, that uh, young people don't want to have sex any longer. Uh, so for that reason, uh, they cannot replenish uh, their societies. And, but they don't want to have, especially Japan, you know, they, Japan does not want to have immigrants, even if they don't look all that different from themselves. Uh, I mean, look at the Koreans in Japan today, but it's the same with the Chinese. Uh, so, I mean, in that sense, um, Japan is an ethnocentric 
country and will remain that. Um, and they may simply fade away because they cannot replenish themselves. So there are dimensions, you know, of tensions that are uh, on the horizon that people, that Rhodes, for example, has not been talking about at all. Well, let me let me go to this. Um, reading that article is, is really kind of a downer because you come out of it at the end wishing and hoping that maybe he's got some ideas there that could save America and the world. Um, so that's why I need I need to make you guys president and vice president for just a moment. Gene, can we make you president? Would you mind? That would um, be very nice. Yes. Yeah, it would be very nice. <laughs> Goes so, <laughs> so uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you would accept the basic, um, you know, criticism uh, that Ben Rhodes makes of the way things have worked in foreign policy in the United States. Um, but let's assume that you like his idea about trying to work our way to a more moderate foreign policy and uh, one that is more likely to work with some of the people who we don't get along with. Um, what would you do if you were running and you were elected in November? What foreign policy would you, how much of Ben Rhodes would you accept? And would you modify it uh, to be more likely of success? Well, first of all, let me put a little coda on what Manfred said. Uh, young people are having plenty of sex. What they're not having are kids. <laughs> it has to be back. Manfred, you, you heard that here on Think Tech yes. Hawaii. Put that aside. The population issue is important. And the great replacement theory, you know, what Charles, Charlottesville uh, white nationalists were saying was uh, Jews will not replace us. You could also say blacks will not replace us or Asians won't replace yes, us. That's important. But the fact is that the MAGA movement was a coming together of something I anticipated in 2011, which is you have the white nationalists and the replacement theorists. Uh, who are a minority and will never be more than a minority, but they somehow hoodwinked uh, the, um, the the great disillusioned evangelical nationalists on their side, and they have the numbers. So you put the numbers together with the extremism of ideology, and then you add a charismatic leader, and what you've got is a proto-fascist situation. And I anticipated that, and it happened, and I never thought it would, but it did. So if I were president or vice president, and well, you're one, president. I like. No, that. let's be clear about that, Gene. You yes. are president. I'm president. Okay. Yes. Um, I think that Biden has threaded the needle amazingly well. Uh, I think one of his greatest strengths is foreign policy. He is first and foremost dedicated to extricating the United States from the largely Republican 21st century involvement in military adventures overseas, which the American people do not want and which has overstrained our voluntary military with multiple uh, uh, deployments. He, he basically does not want to do anything that's going to put military boots on the ground anywhere else in the world. And he is that that's guiding his Ukraine policy as well. So he's much more inclined to providing through um, alliances of um, convenience with other countries, providing the, the resources for Ukraine and for, for the Israelis, but, but not for putting American boots on the ground. So I'll give him credit for that and say he's a moderate. Secondly, he's been around a long time, longer than any other po active politician. And he has been a witness to the Cold War. He's been a witness to the fall of the Soviet Union and a witness to the rise of a, uh, a new alignment in the world. So he's, he's aware of what we face. And I think that um, I would pretty much follow the same foreign policy that he is following. I would draw my red lines carefully and I would stick to them because you have to convey to the American public that you mean what you say and you say what you mean. And Democrats are notoriously too tolerant in that regard. And I think to some extent, Ben Rhodes is too. You cannot solve all problems with diplomacy, but you can certainly use your power to wave a big stick. And I, I have to go back to Teddy Roosevelt there. I wish I wish Joe Biden had a little bit more of Teddy Roosevelt, and I think I would do the same thing. 
Bankford, how about you? There you are in the Oval Office. You're having your daily 10 o'clock meeting with President Rosenfeld. And uh, you're going to agree or disagree. You're going to give her advice about what can and should be done to make the world a better place. Look, I would tell President uh, Rosenfeld that her history is a little bit off uh, <laughs> because the messy American foreign policy is not simply a democratic legacy. The Republican, uh, you know, the United States got the, in the in uh, the Korean War by Truman, and then they took over the mess that the French left in the NBN Fuel 54, that was Eisenhower, was a Republican. And I think it goes on and on, you know, from uh, Democrat to Republican. And I think one of the disasters of uh, Biden's foreign policy was the way he let, I mean, he in a way presided over the messy retreat from Afghanistan. I mean, that created uh, an image problem uh, not only in America, but in the world, uh, about the incompetence of uh, how the U.S. is managing uh, problems that they, to some extent, created themselves. So in that sense, uh, I, I, I think you cannot get away from what Kagan is emphasizing, you know, that you have this divided country and it doesn't, in a way, matter who will be president. This division will be there and has to be managed, has to be dealt with. Um, the January 6th syndrome, you know, is a potential that may explode in in November. Uh, so for that reason, you know, I, I will be very, very critical of President Rosenfeld, uh, you know, when she makes her predictions. But what would you tell her to do? Well, she, look, I, I do not, well. You're, you're the vice president. Yes. Cranford, you've got to say something. You're there in the Oval Office. You have a tremendous amount of influence. Tell her. Well, I don't know whether I would have a tremendous uh, influence uh, because the president, you know, is very strong and very opinionated and so she will not uh, listen to you know oh, no jean jean is not like that jean is jean she'll listen well, to you. she will change her she will undergo a tremendous change when she becomes president and when she has, when absolute she has the, power corrupts absolutely that's right that's right i would not say she will become corrupted but i mean she would suddenly see how powerful she is and the power she has the, the united states has to watch out what is happening in Europe. Uh, and I think they cannot let uh, the Ukraine go under. But on the other hand, I think the United States has to somehow control its ident identification with Israel at this point. Uh, I mean, the image loss, not only of uh, Netanyahu, and Israel, as a result of how the IDF, you know, has behaved in uh, in Gaza and is still continuing to behave, I think is a is a major problem. And I think the United States has to be seen as being less, you know, biased, uh, even though it's very difficult at this point. That's what uh, Ben uh, Ben Ben uh, Rose is saying. Um, Gene, how much of this would be useful to you in the Oval Office? After all, you can accept or reject Manfred's uh, ideas and suggestions. She will reject any, everything. Do <laughs> 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 I? <laughs> no, it's good to have uh, a debate, and um, it's always hard to come up with positive ideas and build ideas which build. Um, I would like to say, Manfred, that uh, I think I did make the point that most of the Republican presidents in the 21st century have gotten us over involved in foreign wars, and Biden has retreated from that. But Biden also opposed um, the war in Iraq, as I recall, the second war in Iraq, which was a disaster. We all, 
all of us scholars knew it was going to be a disaster. But it was a Republican war. It was a Republican war. And unfortunately, the thing is that what we really disagree on, Manfred, is the degree of division in this country. I don't feel that we're as at much risk of a civil war as we are a international involvement in a very significant war. Uh, and I also feel that um, Europe before uh, the Ukraine crisis was drifting away from the United States and toward Russia only because of the energy issue or that right. Russia she was a major energy producer. And one of the things I'm going to point out that Biden will do going forward if he's reelected is he will make the United States the foremost energy producer in the world. And uh, how we do that and also are true to reducing the, the crisis with climate uh, is a big enough challenge for any president. He doesn't need any more challenges beyond that. But we have uh, a coalition, uh, uh, a polar coalition in the world that is determined to undermine Western civilization. So we're still linked with Europe. And the way Europe goes and the way we go, we have to maintain that unity of purpose and, and, and vision um, in, in the face of uh, really significant um, enemies. Yeah, you know, that's a very interesting point. Um, and climate change is really the most important and existential threat uh, to humanity. And uh, with all these wars and contentions and geopolitics, we don't spend enough time dealing with it. And that's one of the things that Ben Rhodes talk, talks about. I think it's a, it's a valuable article because it, it raises so many issues and it's certainly well written. And thank you for sending it around, Gene. Um, and thank you for reading it, Manfred. And uh, thank you for mentioning Robert Kagan. We talked about him before. The, these people, these kinds of articles are so thought provoking, so useful that everybody ought to be reading them and the ones that follow. Because we are at a time when everyone has to be better informed. And I, I sure appreciate you guys coming around and helping us understand. We're out of time. We appreciate your comments and your thoughts and your agreements and your disagreements. <laughs> and thank you for being president, Gene. And thank you for being vice president. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Gene Rosenfeld, Manfred Henningsen. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. We'll see you again soon. Aloha. <laughs>